fluorine is an interesting element for the medicinal chemist because it changes the properties of your compound quite drastically sometimes. It has different electronic effects, it's uh, quite lipophilic, and it might render a compound more metabolically stable, for example, compared to a CH bond. There are a couple of fluorinated compounds that turn up in PICAL, but usually introduction of fluorine carries with it some synthetic challenges, so I wanted to make a video about some fluorinated compounds. Uh, these are some examples that Shulgin was able to make in PICAL. You can see here 2CF, uh, that was made by the low yielding and drastic bowles scheman reaction from the corresponding aniline here. Uh, DOEF was prepared by a deoxyfluorination of an alcohol using DAST, a uh, deoxyfluorinating reagent essentially based on sulfur tetrafluoride. And then in the case of 2CT21, Shulgin buys in the fluoride as part of his starting material and does the alkylation with this bromofluoroethane. But here's a pair of interesting compounds that were actually reported by Nichols and co-workers in 1994, very much continuing the tradition of Shulgin's work. And they were able to use a trifluoromethylation reaction that was published in the recent literature at the time uh, to access these CF3 derivatives. And their starting material was DOI, and this essentially carries on the, uh, the trend of installing a, a bulky lipophilic group at this position. We know from the structures of the magical half dozen that chloro, bromo, and iodo are all quite good in this position. And CF3 represents another sort of bulky lipophilic group. Um, and indeed, uh, if you look at the abstract of the paper, uh, they say that the trifluoromethylated derivatives were the, the most potent of the so-called hallucinogenic amphetamine agonists reported to date, so it turned out to be a very interesting group to be installing at this position. As for how they made it, I've mentioned the starting material was 2CI, or DOI in the case of the amphetamine derivatives. Uh, they found it necessary to protect the amino functionality, so they used a uh, trifluoroacetamide here, and that can be easily installed with trifluoroacetic anhydride, and they normally come off under mild conditions of basic hydrolysis, so it's a, a fairly convenient protecting group to use. And as for how the trifluoromethylation reaction happens, uh, they use this reagent here, methyl chlorodifluoroacetate, so a substituted ester, uh, in the presence of copper 1 iodide, potassium fluoride, Reasonably harsh conditions, 120 degrees in dimethylformamide for seven hours uh, during slow addition of the reagents. Uh, but that converts the aryl iodide bond into an aryl trifluoromethyl compound. As for how this reaction works, they were following a report published by uh, Chen in 1991. And this is a really quite a nice paper. They go into a lot of mechanistic detail and they do some extra experiments to work out what's really going on. And they propose this catalytic cycle for how the reaction works. So to start off with, we have our copper 1 iodide in the reaction mixture and our methyl chlorodifluoroacetate. Uh, the first thing that happens is the iodide actually serves as a nucleophile, attacks the methyl group of the ester in a SN2 reaction, and generates one equivalent of methyl iodide as a byproduct, uh, affording this carboxylate anion in the presence of copper 1. Now, this carboxylate anion can then undergo alpha elimination, so pushing electrons onto this carbon and, and also taking them away as a chloride leaves. And you also see this kind of alpha elimination, for example, in the Rimatiemann formulation when you're generating dichlorocarbene from uh, chloroform under basic conditions. Uh, so in this case, because we have fluorines, um, the generated species is this highly reactive uh, difluorocarbene, and that's sufficiently electrophilic that it traps out the other fluoride that's been introduced from the potassium fluoride. And then in the presence of copper 1, you generate some sort of copper CF3 species. This isn't going to be an ionic salt floating around in solution, but you'll quite often see copper 1 turn up in trifluoromethylation chemistry, and this is some, some aggregate, some salt. Um, anyway, we don't need to know the exact structure because it does what we want, uh, which is to do an oxidative insertion into the aryl iodide bond. So copper 1 oxidative insertion into there to generate this copper 3 intermediate that very much wants to rapidly do a reductive elimination and so we regenerate our copper 1 we get the iodide back from the aryl iodide and so in fact then we've got our copper iodide ready to do another catalytic cycle and after the reductive elimination we formed our aryl CF3 bond so that's the chemistry that enabled the preparation of the trifluoromethylated phenethylamine analogues and I won't talk about the pharmacology of that, that's all in Nichols's paper, and you can read about the various assays they use. Uh, obviously, by this point, these compounds weren't being tested in humans as the first and only assay, so Nichols's group tended to use rats or cell cultures. 
I think it's interesting to consider some other possibilities for trifluoromethylated compounds and for example I think this amphetamine might particularly be interesting so we know this compound here trimethoxyphenethylamine this is not active judging from the reports in PICAL uh, but if we have the methyl group here and turn it into an amphetamine the effective dose in man is 20 to 40 milligrams and this is interesting to consider as a, a matched pair in terms of the SAR with TMA, trimethoxyamphetamine. This is, of course, a mescaline derivative. It's just a mescaline with a, an extra alpha methyl group. So introducing the methyl group into mescaline improves the potency roughly, let's say, by two to threefold. But then by moving this uh, methoxy group around and obtaining that very important 2,5 di substitution pattern, you can see the potency again jumps by roughly fivefold or so. And we know that we want some sort of lipophilicity in this position. We know halogens are good there. If this was an iodide, we'd have DOI. And so if we have a trifluoromethoxy instead of a trifluoromethyl, could this compound have different properties in terms of its pharmacology, its qualitative effects? I, I think it would be potentially quite an interesting one. Um, I'm not going to go over how to install the side chain because all of that chemistry is, is well established. I've talked about it in other videos. I'm just going to reduce the problem to wondering about how we might access this benzaldehyde to do the Henry condensation with nitroethane. And from a look at the literature, it turns out that these trifluoromethoxy groups are rather difficult uh, to introduce. So this is an early report from Shepard in 1964. Um, he reacts phenols with carbonyl fluoride. This is the fluorine analogue of the chemical warfare gas phosgene. Uh, so he takes that, reacts it with a phenol in a steel autoclave at 200 Celsius to form these intermediate formyl fluorides. And the formyl fluorides undergo deoxyfluorination with sulfur tetrafluoride, another vigorously reactive gaseous reagent. Sodium fluoride is added at the end to mop up any excess fluorinating reagent. And again, this second step is rather high temperature, drastic conditions. Uh, but he was able to obtain uh, respectable yields of the trifluoromethoxylated products, although presumably the rest of your molecule needs to be quite robust to tolerate these stringent conditions. Um, not every laboratory is going to be equipped to handle sulfur tetrafluoride or have a steel autoclave, so another possible approach to think about is can we use some sort of specialised reagent to introduce the OCF3 group, and you will already have seen that this reagent looks quite specialised indeed. This was uh, reported by Umemoto and co-workers in 2007, and Umemoto is certainly a big name in the um, fluorine chemistry field. What they found was that by treating uh, phenols, with this reagent they were able to obtain the OCF3 products in, in quite decent yields but under low temperature conditions so this reaction starts at minus 90 is gradually warmed to minus 10. This is certainly a very interesting and reactive reagent so you can see here this is a, a dibenzofuranium cation with formerly an, an OCF3 bond and then a very unreactive uh, hexafluoroantimonate counter ion. This looks uh, by analogy similar to something like Meerwein salt, so we know this uh, serves as a very electrophilic reagent and a source of uh, essentially methyl cations, uh, and in the same way this serves as a source of CF3+. These reagents are certainly not trivial to make either, so the first thing that Umamoto needs to do is obtain these biphenyl systems, treat the aniline with nitrosonium hexafluoroantimonate to afford this aryl diazonium cation, the aryl diazonium cation under irradiation with a high pressure mercury lamp at minus 100 degrees, that undergoes loss of nitrogen and generates this super reactive aryl cation intermediate. Now, normally these oxygen lone pairs would be very unreactive because of the electron withdrawing effects of the CF3 group, but because we have this aryl cation here, that essentially traps out an oxygen lone pair and induces the cyclization to the five membered uh, benzofuranium cation. These are highly reactive and unstable, and indeed they have to be prepared at this low temperature and then used immediately. They decompose thermally on warming. From looking at the reactivity study, and there's a lot more detail in Umamoto's paper, but essentially they behave as if there's some sort of equilibrium between the reagent and the neutral dibenzofuran and a CF3 plus cation. And again, this almost certainly isn't freely floating around in solution, but the reagent behaves as if it's a source of this uh, synthon. And 
the way that they decompose. This is so tremendously reactive that it will actually abstract the fluoride from hexafluoroantimonate to, uh, to generate carbon tetrafluoride. And that just goes to show you how reactive and how electrophilic this is, because normally hexafluoroantimonate is considered a completely passive spectator ion. But by preparing the reagent and using it in situ, um, Umamoto was, as I mentioned, able to obtain these OCF3 products. So phenols will react as expected with this electrophilic source of CF3 uh, and form alpha 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 trifluoro uh, anisole. This is. Um, there's also an interesting comparison in the reactivity depending on the chalcogen you have as the part of the five membered ring. And it's a bit unfortunate, really, because if you have sulfur, uh, these reagents are actually bench stable. So in the case of R equals H, that's actually called, it's known as Umamoto's reagent. You can buy it, uh, you can store it, and you can use it in your various chemistries. It's, it's, it's dead simple. A um, lot more stable than the corresponding oxygen reagent. But in this case, the only product that they observed when reacting uh, the sulfur reagent with the phenol is the C trifluoromethylated products. And for some reason, it's only the much more reactive oxygen reagents that will trifluoromethylate on O, so there's an interesting comparison in the reactivity there between the types of reagent. I was also able to find a, a more recent and relatively more convenient report, so this is from Tobias Ritter and co-workers. They were able to treat aryl tin compounds with this combination of reagents to afford trifluoromethoxylated products in decent yields, but again, they have to go through the work of preparing this special reagent with a very non-coordinating cation here. Um, silver hexafluorophosphate needs to be in the reaction mixture. It happens at cryogenic conditions. Uh, this reagent looks like the commercially available fluorinating reagent select fluor. Uh, the only difference being select fluor is provided as the tetrafluoroborate salt. And they found that they got a 10% increase in yield by using the hexafluorophosphate. So even this commercial reagent needs to be modified slightly before use. Uh, it needs to be under stringently anhydrous conditions in a glove box. Reagents need to be cannulated and the cannulas need to be cooled with dry ice to prevent the reagents decomposing as they travel through the cannula. So yes, this chemistry does work, but you wouldn't enter into it lightly. Another class of compounds we can consider is trifluoromethyl thio groups, where we have the SCF3. Uh, and this compound itself is actually mentioned by Shulgin in his commentary in Pickel uh, when he's making the last of the 2CT series. He actually took this thiophenol and attempted to react it with gaseous iodotrifluoromethane and observed no useful product from this reaction mixture. And this is perhaps not surprising because iodotrifluoromethane doesn't really serve as a source of electrophilic trifluoromethyl groups. Its in reactivity is generally more important in uh, radical systems. But there are other ways now, with more modern chemistry, uh, to access this SCF3 group. And so, again, I won't talk about all the chemistry about how to install the phenethylamine sidechain because we already know how to do that. But if we could obtain a, a building block such as this, uh, you could imagine it might undergo the Vilsmeyer formulation, the Reich formulation, something like that to afford the required benzaldehyde. Uh, and the fact that there are already some commercially available benzaldehydes with this group gives us hope that this chemistry might be a little bit more accessible. Again, going back to the very early literature, uh, the best way into these compounds seems to be via this salt, uh, trifluoromethyl thiosilver. And Emilius and Macduffie in 1961 uh, took silver fluoride and carbon disulfide in an autoclave, and then this reaction is presumably driven by the formation of insoluble silver sulfide, and the trifluoromethyl thiosilver can be obtained through this route. Uh, later on in 1975, Jagopolsky did a, a metathesis reaction, took the silver salt and reacted it with copper bromide in acetonitrile uh, to form trifluoromethyl thiocopper. And again, uh, as I mentioned, copper one turns up in trifluoromethylation chemistry. It also seems to be appropriate for the SCF3 group. So this reagent was competent in transforming aryl iodides under fairly harsh conditions, so prolonged heating at high temperatures in NMP. But regardless, he was able to convert aryl iodides into the corresponding trifluoromethyl thio aryl compounds. Milder methods have now become available on the basis of recent work. So this paper from Magnus Ruping in 2014 
Uh, this describes a thalamide-based reagent, so they take N-chlorothalamide, react it with trifluoromethyl thiol copper, and form this N-SCF3 reagent here. And then in the presence of further copper-1 salts with 2,2-prime bipyridine as the ligand, under much milder conditions, so 45 degrees in DME, they were able to trifluoromethyl thiolate a number of aryl boronic acids in pretty decent yields, so 86% here for this substrate. One set of conditions I like even more was published in the same year by Shen and co-workers, and they used this saccharin-derived reagent. So they take saccharin, react it with terbutyl hypochlorite to form the N-chlorinated intermediate, and then reaction with the silver salt we saw previously, and presumably through precipitation of silver chloride, forms again an NSCF3 reagent. And this apparently serves uh, simply as a source of electrophilic SCF3 groups, so this will react with various nucleophiles, they don't need to add any additional metal catalysts, salts, or ligands, or anything. They simply took uh, various activated airenes, um, they heated them in the presence of uh, triflic acid, so that is an activating reagent. Um, but this is actually an example from the paper itself, a 73% yield of the trifluoromethylthiolated 1,4-dimethoxybenzene. And that's particularly good because that's exactly the building block we need to make the phenethylamine product. All we then need to do is formulate it and put on the side chain. So in conclusion, I hope I've managed to show you some interesting trifluoromethylation chemistry. There's an entire subfield based around introducing this group because of its valuable properties. And thanks to Nichols and co-workers, this trifluoromethylated phenethylamine has actually been made. I think from what we've just seen that this compound is probably accessible using known chemistry because we can get as far as the building block and it just remains to put the side chain on. This compound, I think, would be an interesting addition to the 2CT series because we have a slight change in lipophilic and electronic properties around the sulfur. I think that might have different effects. I think the outlook is uh, more bleak for the trifluoromethoxylated compound, though these still seem to be quite difficult to prepare.